Today's lecture is on cerebral palsy. Cerebral palsy is an umbrella term uh, for damage to the nervous system that occurs early on in development, either in the womb or immediately after birth. Because uh, this is an umbrella term, we're going to have a wide variety of, um, of, of symptoms that can occur, and those symptoms that occur can have a variety of severities. So we'll talk about the different classifications for cerebral palsy and the risk factors for developing cerebral palsy in the first part, and then in the second part we'll review the pathophysiology. The good news is that there's really uh, not a whole lot that's new here, so most of it's of course repetition of uh, the, the first and second units. Because there's, again, only so many ways you can kill off a neuron. <clears throat> so when we're talking about cerebral palsy, uh, really what we're talking about is uh, a, a collection of symptoms that are going to present uh, early on in life because of some early damage to the nervous system. <clears throat> and the most common symptom to see is going to be motor disorder. And, and that's because a lot of our nervous system is devoted to moving our body around. So it's fairly easy to affect movement. And it's also fairly easy to see, uh, also fairly easy to see um, when movement is abnormal. <clears throat> the incidence and prevalence of cerebral palsy are fairly similar because cerebral palsy doesn't affect lifespan very much. We'll get about 0.2 to 0.25 percent uh, of newborns being affected by cerebral palsy each year and because the survivability is pretty good this essentially carries through across all age groups. <clears throat> One of the major risk factors for developing cerebral palsy would be early birth. Um, and this, along with the tendency to see low birth weights, likely contributes to the increased uh, incidence in, in black infants compared to whites. So let's look at this plot here and see what this means here. we got two bars to make sense of. There's the blue bar, which is the uh, number of cerebral palsy cases per 1,000 within each age group. And the age that we're looking at would be the age at birth. <clears throat> So how long were they in the womb? That, that first set there on the left are going to be 20 to 27 uh, weeks. Then we get a little bit older as we move to the right. Uh, once we're at 37 plus, we're pretty much full term at that point. So the blue bar is the normalized um, incidence of cerebral palsy. And you'll see that the younger they are at birth, the more uh, likely we are to see cerebral palsy. But there are relatively few very young births. Most births are at or near full term and that's why the green bar increases as you move from left to right. So the green bar is just the percentage of all cerebral palsy cases here. Most people with cerebral palsy are going to have normal full term birth. <clears throat> but Having that early birth is a clear risk factor because we see a much higher incidence of cerebral palsy in that group. It's just that there are so few very young births that they account for a much smaller percentage of the total of cerebral palsy cases. Low birth weight and early birth uh, is going to be more common uh, in black infants. And, and that explains the increase in incidence for cerebral palsy in black infants. So uh, as, uh, compared to the 0.2 to 0.25 percent, here we see 0.3, 0.4 percent. So it may be up to double uh, compared to other groups there. <clears throat> now, anything that affects uh, the health of the developing fetus or the um, newborn is going to be a risk factor for cerebral palsy. So you can have a look at here, there's a variety of these uh, risk factors that occur in the womb, that would be prenatal, uh, during birth, that would be perinatal, and then immediately after birth, those would be the postnatal factors. And all of these have to do with essentially decreased nutritional support uh, or some sort of damage to the nervous system. So the prenatal factors like infection or, or malnutrition, uh, exposure to radiation, what these are going to do is potentially damage the nervous system. 
course, the inflammatory response due to infection can damage the nervous system. Uh, malnutrition uh, may lead to inadequate development uh, because we're unable to properly feed and sustain uh, our, our nerve cells. Uh, difficulty during birth can lead to trauma and therefore cause damage to the nervous system. Um, any abnormalities in blood flow either during development or <clears throat> during birth uh, can increase the risk of cerebral palsy. And then after birth, uh, early infection, early exposure to toxins, or early physical trauma can lead to cerebral palsy. <clears throat> So there's a variety of things that can cause cerebral palsy, and that's why it's such a diverse uh, umbrella term here. Really all it says is that early on in development we have damage to the cerebrum. That's all cerebral palsy means. And for the most part, uh, this diagnosis is going to be based on failure to meet motor milestones uh, or seeing motor abnormalities like abnormal reflexes, something that's suggestive of upper motor neuron damage. You can, you can see damage with imaging, at least in some cases. So what we're looking at here would be a T2-weighted MRI. And what that means um, is that the white matter is going to appear darker and the gray matter is going to appear lighter. We're using T2 MRI here because it's much easier to see pathology in that case. Everything looks normal here. <clears throat> if we move ahead here, now we can see some abnormalities. Uh, the black arrowheads there... Uh, are, are hopefully drawing your eyes to the appropriate area where we see a hyperintensity in the white matter. What that tells us is that we have some inflammation going on. We have some damage to the white matter, and this is common in cerebral palsy. Uh, we can also see enlarging of the ventricles in some cases. So when you see enlarged ventricles or you see damage in white matter, that's going to be suggestive of developing cerebral palsy. And the degree to which you see white matter lesions either being very mild here, uh, in this case uh, the patient went on to develop diplegia, or weakness in two limbs there. This case uh, was quadriplegia. So here we see more pronounced white matter lesions, so the yellow, area, uh, the yellow arrowheads are showing you uh, the more severe areas of damage. And there's a little bit of diffuse, uh, weaker white matter damage below that. With a T2 MRI, you can see that. When the white matter isn't uniformly dark and you see those areas of hyperintensity, that's suggestive of white matter damage. <clears throat> and you see that in about half the cases. Of course, you'll see other uh, potential issues in cerebral palsy. And I want you to go down and look at normal there, just above total. You'll notice that about uh, 11, or in some cases, upwards of 17% of Cerebral palsy patients have no abnormalities that are visible by MRI. So imaging alone isn't going to make that determination whether or not someone has cerebral palsy. Largely it's going to be determined by following them over time and looking at the achievement of motor milestones. And any significant delay in the achievement of motor milestones is going to be suggestive of cerebral palsy. <clears throat> Now, we're all snowflakes, and there's a wide variety of what's normal for achieving these motor milestones. Uh, but certainly the inability to, to sit unassisted by two years of age is a, a fairly safe cutoff um, uh, to make that determination. But we're going to follow across time. And one of the things that we'll look for is an abnormality in muscle tone. And really what we're talking about here is um, spasticity or hypertonicity for the most part. <clears throat> because that's what you see in the majority of cases. So that hypertonicity or the spasticity there would be the, the large blue slice of the pie there. So most cerebral palsy patients are going to have hypertonicity. And that should make sense because cerebral palsy would be damage to the cerebrum. And the cerebrum is where we have our upper motor neurons. <clears throat> so those white matter lesions that we see. The white matter lesions are going to affect the axons of our upper motor neurons. So what we'll see is upper motor neuron type weakness. 
From that, we should see increased muscle tone. We should see uh, abnormal hyperreflexia. And that's what you see in the majority of cases. But of course, as I said in the beginning, cerebral palsy is an umbrella term. And depending on where you have the damage, that's going to determine what types of motor symptoms we see. For example, if we have damage down below in the basal ganglia, for example, well, here we might see chorea or dystonia as opposed to just the spasticity that we'll see with those white matter lesions affecting upper motor neurons. But because these are far more common than lesions in the basal ganglia, the spasticity is far more common than other types of motor disorders. <clears throat> but you can see a variety of, uh, of motor dysfunction. Uh, early on, you, you may very well see hypotonicity. And this is kind of akin to what we see early on with spinal cord injuries, where you have that spinal shock, where you have an, a decrease in muscle tone followed by the later development of hypertonicity as the upper motor neuron weakness becomes more um, uh, apparent. Not only are we going to affect our somatic nervous system, we'll also affect the autonomic nervous system, and so we can see a host of other symptoms here. <clears throat> there may be issues with salivating or, or GI function, and that along with poor coordination or use of the limbs uh, can affect feeding as a result. Now we'll see different involvement of limbs and of course this depends on the location and the size of these lesions that we see. So depending on where we have damage to the cerebrum and how widespread, we can affect anywhere between uh, one to four limbs. <clears throat> the more widespread the damage, the more widespread the motor dysfunction here. Uh, I've given you some numbers there. You'll notice they don't add up to 100% because not every case was specified. But the most common to see here would be diplegia, uh, where we have um, paralysis in, in two limbs there. But it's variable. It depends on uh, the location and size of injury. <clears throat> we can then rate the severity or the level of uh, function um, using the gross motor function classification system. And it's going to go from 1 uh, to 5, 1 being uh, essentially completely independent. There's um, minimal change in their ability to move around. Uh, you'll see some, maybe some changes in muscle tone, but they can move independently. They can go upstairs. There's no limitations to how far they'll walk. Going all the way down to 5, where they're completely dependent uh, on uh, others and, and motorized uh, mobility aids in order to move about. <clears throat> Of course, between 1 and 5, we have a, a, a spectrum of dysfunction where you might require uh, just a little bit of, of assistance. Maybe your balance is poor. You might require some manual walking aids. You might require a bit of mobilized um, the walking aids, but you can still assist with transfers and moving about. <clears throat> so this is another way of looking at uh, the, the, the uh, severity of cerebral palsy. <clears throat> While it's impossible to, to determine how things are going to end up later in life, again, looking at, at function at the age of two, if they're able to sit up on their own, that's a, that's a pretty good indicator that they'll have reasonable uh, independent mobility later on in life. And if they aren't able to sit up, then they're likely to fall into those lower, or I'm sorry, the, the higher levels there, the more severe um, uh, dysfunction, so levels four and five. Aside from the motor uh, uh, effects of cerebral palsy, uh, you can see a, a number of other um, uh, issues arising, <clears throat> again, depending on the location of damage. Now, while we are, are very likely to affect motor pathways, we're also going to affect sensory pathways, and, and as a result, it, it's not uncommon to see pain in cerebral palsy patients. You'll see, see here about three and four are going to experience uh, some level of chronic pain that's going to require some treatment. Intellectual disability is a, is a coin flip. That of course depends on the site and size of, of the uh, damage there. And you can go through this, uh, this, this uh, table on your own time. 
it's it's pretty nice there. But you'll see some of these are going to uh, involve sensory dysfunction, others cognitive dysfunction, the uh, bladder incontinence there, and sleep disorders. Those are those are going to be more related to autonomic uh, dysfunction there. <clears throat> it's a little more uncommon to see um, uh, special sensory uh, function loss like vision and, and hearing. Usually the, the sensory dysfunction is going to be somatosensory uh, just because we're, we're dealing with a, a far greater number of fibers there. As far as lifespan goes, it's fairly normal for the most part aside from from the tails so the the very young so before four and after fifty there's a slight decrease in, in their um, uh, lifespan there but most uh, cerebral palsy patients are going to have a normal lifespan <clears throat> and they uh, seem to have a normal quality of life as well so in this uh, set of data here we're looking in children and adolescents, so children on the left, adolescents on the right. Cerebral palsy would be the green box plots and below that we have age matched controls who don't have cerebral palsy shown in blue. And You can see that the, the variety of quality of life ratings uh, that they've completed here are largely the same. So very comparable quality of life and length of life in cerebral palsy patients. <clears throat> Now, cerebral palsy, unlike everything that we talked about in Unit 2, is a non-progressive uh, disorder, meaning you have that early insult. So you have your early on white matter lesion, uh, but it doesn't get worse from there. That doesn't mean that, that symptoms won't seem to worsen, uh, but that's just because symptoms become more apparent as we age, uh, because we gain function. When we're first born, we can root and suck, and that's about it. Uh, not soon after, we quickly get the ability uh, to, to wet and crap ourselves and then cry to get attention, but that's about it. We're not up walking around, we're not having to, to make any sort of decisions, <clears throat> we can't communicate what's going on, so it's very difficult to determine dysfunction in a newborn because they have very little function as it is. It's only after we age and they're... they're their peers start to develop function and they are, they're, they're failing to meet those milestones that we see the development of cerebral palsy. But that's not to say that the lesions underlying that disorder are getting any worse. It's just that they're becoming apparent. And the, when we're talking lesions, largely what we're talking about would be white matter lesions. <clears throat> so in the white matter, this is where we have all the axons running that are going to connect different parts of the cortex with itself so that we can put together information. Uh, so I'll try to quickly put together a little brain here. Something like that. Uh, we'll have a couple of ventricles here. <clears throat> There's probably a thalamus that's buried in there. But around the edge, this is where we have our gray matter. And in the gray matter, this is where we have cell bodies and the dendrites. The white matter is where we connect together different areas of the cortex. They could be near one another, uh, so they could be near, uh, far, wherever they are. They're going to be connected by white matter. They could be on the same side, it could be crossing sides in the different hemispheres, but in the white matter we have axons. <clears throat> and these axons appear white because of the myelin that's there. <clears throat> now we don't, we don't always have myelin surrounding our axons. Early on in development, when the axons are actually crawling from one area to another, they're not myelinated because they don't exist yet. Myelination occurs later on. <clears throat> and it's going to continue um, after we're born. So first we build our connections and then we, we uh, improve their efficiency through myelination. <clears throat> we tend to see white matter lesions around the ventricles and when these are uh, uh, kind of larger cystic lesions and we see obvious signs of necrosis, we call it periventricular leukomalacia, which just means around the ventricles, uh, white softening. So we're going to see damage in the white matter near the ventricles. That's all that term means. <clears throat>
<clears throat> this is fairly common in uh, cerebral palsy patients, especially when they're uh, with, when they are born early. So those preterm births with cerebral palsy, the overwhelming majority of cases are going to have white matter lesions around the ventricles. And that, that preterm birth is such a risk factor for white matter damage because the white matter isn't really that white uh, when, when we're 23 to 32 weeks. <clears throat> we haven't yet myelinated the axons. And hopefully we remember that myelin is important to axons because it improves their efficiency. <clears throat> Comparing it, uh, a myelinated axon to an unmyelinated axon, the myelinated axon is going to have very few areas where it's able to move ions. So only at the nodes are we going to have ion channels. In a non-myelinated axon, we are going to have ion channels the entire length. So here, because we have ion channels, throughout the entire axon, that means we're moving ions throughout the entire axon, and that means we need more ATP to keep this neuron alive. Let me, let me write that and not scratch it out immediately. More ATP. Okay. <clears throat> that means that these non-myelinated axons that we see early on in development are going to be far more susceptible to disruptions in blood flow. <clears throat> and that's why those abnormalities in the formation of the placenta or in the movement of blood through the umbilical cord are going to be major risk factors for cerebral palsy. Because early on in development, we need a constant supply of blood even more so than after. We've already covered stroke. We know what happens even after we're adults and we deprive the brain of blood for a few minutes. We're going to see neuron loss. <clears throat> This is even more uh, important early on in development when we're dealing with non-myelinated axons because they're far more expensive than a myelinated axon. In early on in development, we don't have that auto-regulation of our cerebral vasculature. <clears throat> so we got two things that we're looking at here. We got a, a full-term birth on, on, on top there, and we got our our preterm birth on the bottom, and they're just measuring blood pressure over different periods of time there. They got systolic, mean, diastolic. You can see the uh, scale on the bottom there. <clears throat> on top, when we're outside of that preterm window, fairly constant blood pressure. But in the, the lower graph there, you'll notice a drop in blood pressure. <clears throat> and what I need you to keep in mind is that the amount of blood that we're putting into our cerebrum, so the uh, cerebral perfusion pressure, is the difference between mean arterial pressure and the intracranial pressure. <clears throat> so if we wanted to increase blood flow to the brain, what we could do is dilate our blood vessels. So if we vasodilate, and widen our blood vessels, that drops pressure in them. And because we lower that pressure within the cerebrum there, that's going to allow for blood to move into the brain. <clears throat> when we see those drops in our mean arterial pressure over time, and we're unable to vasodilate in these preterm births, that's going to lead to a net decrease in cerebral perfusion pressure. So we're going to have less delivery of blood to the brain, so we're not going to get enough oxygen and glucose to keep these not yet myelinated neurons fed. <clears throat> when they run out of ATP, they'll depolarize and experience excitotoxicity. Of course, the white matter lesions that occur as a result of neuron damage then lead to inflammation, reactive gliosis, and that can make matters worse, as described in all the lectures before this one. The areas where we tend to see these white matter lesions are, not surprisingly, in those watershed zones or border zones that we went over in Lecture 3 when we talked about uh, stroke. 
was that three? Four. Lecture four, when we talked about stroke. <clears throat> so in those border zones where the, the different uh, cerebral blood vessels are meeting up with one another, at this point, they're at their, their end. And every time we branch, our blood vessels are going to get a little bit thinner so that out there at the edge, we have very fine blood vessels in our border zones. <clears throat> so you can see the, the different territories of the anterior, middle, and posterior cerebral arteries here, shown in blue, yellow, and pretty much red, uh, respectively. There's also border zones, of course, within the white matter. And not surprisingly, this is where you see the majority of your white matter lesions, is right there in those border zones. Click back in the slides and you'll see in those T2 MRI images, they are falling on these border zones, <clears throat> either within the basal ganglia there or out in the white matter. And that's because of that branching that branching that occurs. And that's what we're seeing in these data here. So what they did um, <clears throat> was actually measure the diameter, or the radius in this case, uh, of the anterior, middle, and posterior cerebral arteries at different branch points. So branch point one would be, here's where it originates. So here's where uh, that internal parotid is gonna become the middle cerebral artery. Here's branch point one. Let's look at the radius here. Now it's branched again. Let's look at the radius there. Now it's branched again, etc., etc. So they follow it out to uh, 12 branch points for the MCA. It looks like only 11 for the others. And you'll see as you increase the, the branching, going from left to right, the radius is dropping there. So the, the blood vessels are becoming much smaller. When they're smaller, higher pressure. That means that these areas in those watershed zones are more susceptible to those drops in blood pressure that occur in premature birth. <clears throat> Fail to deliver enough blood, run the risk of excitotoxicity. Now the perinatal infection and inflammation that occurs <clears throat> may lead to cerebral palsy because of the effects of uh, bilirubin. So when we, when we uh, break down our uh, red blood cells, <clears throat> so whenever we, uh, that's what you'll see in neonatal jaundice. So in jaundice, uh, which is going to occur to some degree in all newborns, um, the excess red blood cells are getting broken down and that's forming uh, bilirubin and that will give uh, the, the, the newborn a kind of a yellowish color. <clears throat> Excessive uh, buildup of bilirubin can then stimulate inflammation in the uh, central nervous system leading to uh, potentially cerebral palsy. So that neonatal jaundice or the, the buildup of bilirubin is going to stimulate the release of tumor necrosis factor from astrocytes. So that's what the data on top are showing us. And there's, there's quite a bit going on here. Just look at the bars. <clears throat> so the bars are just showing us the amount of TNF-alpha uh, that is released when treated with unconjugated bilirubin. That's what UCB is. And then it's just different doses of, of uh, bilirubin there. So either 50 or 100 uh, micromolar. They let it sit uh, for a day and then they measure the amount of TNF-alpha uh, that was released. The, the two sets on the left there, new, those are from neurons, and the ast there are showing you astrocytes. Not surprisingly, astrocytes are, are going to respond more so uh, to the, the bilirubin there because they're um, more direct players in inflammation. Uh, for more on that, uh, see le that's lecture three right there. <clears throat> so the uh, unconjugated bilirubin that uh, enters the central nervous system uh, during jaundice is going to then stimulate an inflammatory response and that inflammatory response can then increase intracranial pressure uh, that can of course cause the uh, deprivation of uh, 
of blood flow in those border zones. It can also cause reactive gliosis, uh, which can impair glutamate uptake or potassium buffering, just like in pretty much every other lecture in this class. And the bilirubin itself, although it doesn't stimulate a whole lot of uh, TNF-alpha release from neurons, it can affect them as well. <clears throat> so the, the bilirubin can activate uh, calcium channels, and, and when it stimulates calcium channels, that's going to activate the neuron, potentially leading to excitotoxicity, either through depolarization by calcium or by glutamate release, because that calcium is going to stimulate glutamate release, and that glutamate then excites neurons. Bilirubin uh, can also permeabilize mitochondrial membranes, and when you permeabilize mitochondrial membranes, you stimulate apoptosis. And there's also some effects on the cytoskeleton. Uh, that's what the data on the bottom are showing us. L let's not worry about those. It's a nice pretty picture, and what it's showing you is that the, um, the microtubule binding proteins that should be in the dendrites, that would be MAP2. MAP2 just is mitochondrial associated protein 2. Uh, MAP2 is normally found in the dendrites and cell body, and you find tau in the axon. And this is the same tau that we talked about in Alzheimer's disease. <clears throat> You'll notice that that, that, uh, that transition between MAP2 and tau kind of shifts away from the cell body. So there's some change in how the neuron itself is organized. That's a minor point, though. <clears throat> Now, more relevant to you all would be the muscle contractures um, that occur in cerebral palsy. Uh, these muscle contractures uh, occur because of an alteration in muscle development. Uh, what we see are fewer satellite cells in cerebral palsy, and those satellite cells would be the stem cells for muscle fibers. And so we get underdeveloped muscles. <clears throat> we get much shorter muscles. To try to compensate for this, uh, we see an increase in sarcomere length, but that doesn't fully compensate. And rather than having full length muscles, we get a little bit of shortening, and we'll see that that's going to affect uh, joint angles in just a little bit. Now that increase in sarcomere length is also going to increase uh, the amount of tension on the muscle while it's passive. <clears throat> In addition to altered development of muscle fibers, we see a change in the amount of extracellular matrix in, in the muscles themselves. So the extracellular matrix, which is largely composed of collagen, is going to expand in cerebral palsy. So uh, before we move ahead, look at the uh, illustrations on the bottom. So part C is showing you the cartoon version, and then E and F is showing you the cross-section and then a longitudinal view of the muscle fiber. So if you look in the cross section there in part E or the cartoon in C, the, the, the void is showing you the muscle fiber. So the black area is showing you the muscle fiber and what they've done is stained for collagen in red. So if you look in part E, it kind of looks like a spider web. That's the collagen surrounding muscle fibers. Now have a look at it as it changes here in cerebral palsy. There's a whole lot more collagen. The muscle fibers are, are shrinking a bit and the collagen is expanding around them, and that collagen is giving us tougher, stiffer muscles. So the, the increase in collagen and the increase in sarcomere length is going to give us a, a tough, stiff muscle as a result. <clears throat> Here they are side by side, so it's much easier to see. We have far more collagen in the case of cerebral palsy. And because we have those shortened, tough muscles, uh, uh, what we'll see would be uh, the abnormal joint angles. And so one of the common things to see would be the Aquinas gait where the, the toes are pointed downward. And so you'll see toe walking um, in some cerebral palsy patients as a result. <clears throat> as far as preventing and treating cerebral palsy, uh, it really comes down to m making sure that the developing a fetus gets adequate nutrition and, and blood flow. Um, this involves taking your prenatal vitamins, eating properly, sleeping properly, um, etc. <clears throat> we can also uh, use a few different treatments uh, in the case of early birth to help reduce the risk of cerebral palsy. So we're going to look at three different treatments here uh, in, in this table that I've put for you. Um, so it's data from a few different studies. So they had different uh, inclusion uh, criteria 
for the studies, and that's why there's that little asterisk there for cooling. So for magnesium sulfate and corticosteroids, here they're just looking at any early birth. For the cooling, they included early birth that had evidence of brain damage or um, asphyxia. So if the child was a, a very high risk case here, not just early birth, but early birth and some sign that we, we, are, we expect damage to the nervous system, then they were included. And that's what's going to affect the number needed to treat, uh, just because the control group has a much higher uh, rate of developing cerebral palsy. <clears throat> but all these are, are fairly good treatments, um, certainly better than nothing. So for magnesium sulfate, uh, we load the mother up with magnesium sulfate, and that magnesium is going to uh, block NMDA receptors and calcium channels. So we're going to reduce the excitability of neurons with magnesium. So these neurons that are, that are susceptible to excitotoxicity, the magnesium there is going to inhibit two things that excite neurons. NMDA receptors. <clears throat> this is what glutamate binds to. It has a long open time, uh, moves a lot of ions. And then we're also going to block our voltage-gated calcium channels. Both of these together are going to increase our membrane potential. So they're going to depolarize the neuron. By blocking them, we make our neurons less excitable. <clears throat> and thus we reduce the risk of developing cerebral palsy. Uh, corticosteroid injections immediately after birth are going to uh, reduce inflammation and promote lung development <clears throat> to, to, again, increase the likelihood that the newborn is able to properly uh, uh, ventilate and move well oxygenated blood into the brain and make sure that we don't run the risk of depriving neurons uh, of nutritive support. <clears throat> now, um, the, the postnatal treatments Right after birth, we can do uh, whole body and brain cooling. So we'll, we'll, we'll reduce the body temperature from our uh, 98.6 uh, down to around 91.8 or so uh, degrees. So we're going to cool the whole body down. Uh, this is done within about six hours of birth and then uh, is maintained for about 72 hours. Uh, of course, this has some risk with it, and that's why there was the different inclusion criteria there. <clears throat> but this also effectively reduces the risk of cerebral palsy. By cooling the body, what we're really doing is just simply decreasing metabolic rates. <clears throat> when you decrease the temperature, every reaction is going to be slower. So everything going on in these cells slows down, and in doing so, we make them less excitable, and we reduce their ATP usage and need. <clears throat> now, outside of that uh, 6 to 72 hour window that we just covered with body cooling, uh, the main thing that we're going to do to treat cerebral palsy, uh, and by we I mean you, is with task-specific uh, physical therapy. So helping patients uh, carry out the task that they're having difficulties with. Physical therapy is going to be very important for that. And not only in improving uh, their, their function, but also, of course, uh, providing uh, support to the family as well uh, and helping them understand what's going on in cerebral palsy. We can treat the muscle as well with muscle relaxants. So uh, baclofen, that would be a GABA B agonist, or we can inject Botox. And that Botox is, of course, going to prevent stimulation of the muscle by motor neurons. And so with this increase in muscle tone, one of the things that we can do to decrease it would be to cut down on neurotransmitter release. Now we'll talk a whole lot more about how we release neurotransmitters next semester, but of course, like everything in life, it's carried out by proteins. <clears throat> and the proteins that are going to fuse these vesicles are going to be the target of Botox. So let's zoom in here. The vesicle at the presynaptic site is going to be held there with some uh, proteins called the snare proteins. <clears throat> 
<clears throat> so our snare proteins must function properly for us to fuse the vesicle and spit out neurotransmitter. I think I've gone over this before. Uh, but since we already have this here, what Botox is going to do is cut up the snare proteins. When you get rid of snare proteins, you prevent the release of neurotransmitter. When you decrease the amount of acetylcholine that you spit out on the muscle, you decrease uh, the muscle excitability. So that will reduce muscle tone there. Of course, it's short-lived. <clears throat> Something a little longer-lived would be surgery. <clears throat> we can do a dorsal rhizotomy where we're going to cut the dorsal roots there. <clears throat> now, of course, the dorsal roots are the sensory roots. <clears throat> but remember, we're dealing with upper motor neuron weakness. And the reason that upper motor neuron damage leads to an increase in muscle tone is because those lower motor neurons in the anterior horn are far more dependent on sensory input. So, uh, let me finish this because I have to. We're going to cut the dorsal root there. What that does is cut off the sensory feedback that would stimulate <coughs> reflexes. By cutting off that sensory input here, <coughs> we're going to decrease the amount of excitatory input to our motor neurons. So we're going to make the lower motor neurons less excitable as a result. <coughs> We can also use surgery to correct joint angles so that that, uh, that um, uh, prolonged uh, plantar flexion of the foot there can be corrected by tendon transfers <coughs> or just recession of the tendons there. So orthopedic surgery here can correct that uh, foot angle there. All right, I got a few review questions for you here. If you have any questions for me on this material or anything else, send me an email, and I'll um, I'll answer everyone's questions all at once um, in, in a video on probably Friday. I don't know uh, when exactly. Uh, it depends on childcare, really. So, uh, in addition to to making these uh, videos for you, I also have to look after three little kids during this time. <clears throat> but I'll get a video up to you to answer your questions, uh, or I'll send a, a class-wide email or something like that. Uh, but I need to know what you don't know. So somehow let me know. Either fill out the class website uh, question box or send me emails. Or just comment on this video. That will probably work too. Alright, that's all I got for you. I'll see you later.